CD. And you are live, three, two, one. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today is October 13th uh, in the year 2005, and this is the beginning of an interview with Mr. William Joseph Shire at the office of Macomb Catholic Services, 15945 Canal Road in Clinton Township, Michigan. Uh, Mr. Shire is 80 years of age, having been born on February 20th, 1926. Uh, Mr. Shire currently resides at 37755 Pebble Point, Pebble Point Court in Clinton Township. Uh, my name is Butch Koff, and I will be the interviewer today. Uh, Mr. Paul Wilhelm will be the videographer, assisted by Mr. Jerry Goolsby. Mr. Shire, would you state for the recording what branch and uh, war you served in, and I, where did you serve? I was uh, with the uh, U.S. Army, the 63rd Infantry Division. I was a medical corpsman, and I served in France and Germany uh, in 44 and 1945 up until the uh, end of the war in Europe. Okay. Well, let, let's see if we can jog your memory. Uh, Mr. Shire, Bill, may I call you Bill? Yes. Let's start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you were born, where did you grow up, go to school, and how you ended up in the branch of service in the Army. It's a long story, Butch, but uh, I was born on the east side of Detroit in the Van Dyke Harper area. Uh, the uh, street was Marcus, if it's of any concern. And I came out just under 10 pounds, and my mother was uh, uh, barely 100 pounds. And I, it was the day after the, one of the biggest snowstorms in the history of Detroit. My uh, father had uh, one heck of a time driving his Ford with 30-inch wheels to pick up the midwife to, to bring to uh, help my, uh, my mother at, her, at my birth. I lived almost all of my life on the east side of Detroit. Uh, we stayed uh, in several locations there in that same area up until 1928, two years later, when my dad decided he was going to get uh, a little better results as far as income by moving to Flint with his uh, younger brother. And uh, so he moved up there, and we were only up there for a little over a year when the, the Depression hit 29. My third brother was born at that time there. So we moved back to Detroit after that and came right back to the same area, just a couple blocks away from where I was born. And at that uh, place is where I started school at the age of four and a half. Uh, it was just down the street to Cooper Elementary School, just a couple blocks from our place on Georgia. And from there we uh, must have had financial problems because it wasn't long when my dad moved again. And this time we were to McClellan and Gratiot. And we were there for three or four years from 1931 until 1935. At that time, I attended Chandler School, and that's where I started the first grade. And uh, there must have been financial problems again because then uh, you uh, had to move out of our place on McClellan. We moved to, uh, six blocks away to over Peter Hunt Rones, but we were only there six months, so I only had three months of school at A.L. Holmes there. Well, my dad got tired of uh, all this uh, moving and everything, so uh, a great aunt of my mother's uh, had a place for sale just three miles up the street, up on Rones, and they decided to purchase it. It was a, a rambling wreck, if I've ever seen one, and I was only 10 years old at the time, back in uh, December of 35 when we moved in there. Uh, I mean the real wreck, and I, uh, my dad had to plaster holes in the wall and, and he wallpapered over everything so you can see all the lousy plaster and he covered the floor with yards of linoleum uh, because there was no way to repair those walls, floors at that time. So I spent uh, the rest of my years there prior to my marriage, uh, which is a leap forward, but going, I attended school there, Chandler School, for uh, one term when my mother and dad decided to try a parochial school. So I entered St. Catherine School in the sixth grade. And I stayed there until the 10th grade when uh, the war broke out. My mother thought that uh, I should uh, maybe uh, get a job outside of the, the school, maybe contribute to the income. You know, times were still hard for the family. 
So I did that, but it turns out that the, the jobs, if you didn't have an education, they were what I call today rugby w jobs, you'd never take them. Um, but I, I, I persevered with them and kept uh, at it uh, for the two years until I turned 18 in February 1944. And immediately, the 1st of March, I started receiving my papers to uh, that uh, Selective Service wanted me, and that was to take some physicals and uh, all the information was uh, processed for me so uh, I could be uh, brought into the service. So you were drafted? I was drafted. I would not volunteer. Uh, I don't know why people volunteer to go to war to get killed, because I'm against it, and I still am today. But uh, on April 1st, I went down to uh, Jer uh, Jefferson and uh, Larned and uh, right in there, uh, Joseph Capo to uh, the building where they were giving out physicals. And after putting me through some very embarrassing tests that I thought, running around the place stripped and nude, which I'd never done in my life, and when it was completed, they said, you're okay, you're in. So I said, you know, it's April 1st today, April Fool's Day. I said, you went fooling, would you? They said, no, you're in the Army now. And that was it. So a month later, exactly on May 1st, the You got to come home for a month to say goodbye and? No, actually, they let you stay at home, right, oh, for okay. one month until you got your papers to report to uh, the uh, induction center. So on May 1st, I got those papers. So I had 10 days to clean up everything in my job and whatever. Um, and on May 11th, my dad uh, took the bus with me down to uh, Michigan Central Depot where I had my first train ride to take it to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, where I was to be inducted. We got there a little late. We were supposed to be inducted on that date, but uh, they waited till the next morning, May 12th, and proceeded to give us a bunch of more physicals and everything in a great big barn uh, if they had to give you shots and whatever you needed, and then all of a sudden you put your hand up and you said, I do, Uncle Sam. Now, is that where boot camp is also? No. Oh. So this was just the induction center. And you stay there until they have everybody uh, processed and assigned. And four days later, on the 16th of May, uh, we uh, boarded the train for Camp Hood, Texas. And it was one of the worst clunkers I've seen as far as carriers are concerned, still had a dual steam engine and the sawdust and soot was coming in, sawdust, there was soot, black soot that come into that car by the time we got to Camp Hood, Texas, two days later. So your first recollection of the Army experience is not no. really the best? No, no, it wasn't. Hot cars, it turned out, 1944 is one of the hottest summers we had since like 1988 here in Detroit. It was. 100 down there, over 100 every day. And we came into camp with our ODs on, which is the heavy duty uniform. Uh, and some of the guys even passed out marching into camp from the train. So then uh, that was the 18th of uh, May. And then we proceeded to have four weeks of basic training at Camp Hood. It's regular rifle, general army training. and. Uh, Second weekend we were there, June 6th occurred, and everybody thought, oh man, they've invaded France, Europe now, the war's going to be over a couple of weeks, we'll be home at the end of the month. Of course, that was just a fallacy and wishful thinking on the parts of all of us GIs down there at the camp. And we finished up four weeks of basic training. That was pretty short, training. four weeks. Is it just to just get the, replacements back over? Uh, no, this was just the... the Give you just basic training so you know what you're doing, you're supposed to do in the Army. Okay. But after the four weeks, then you went into a specific training, which it turned out for me I was putting the anti tank gun unit. Uh -huh. And uh, we were trained on 37 millimeter and 57 millimeter tanks, uh, guns, these anti tank guns. Where was this at? Same place, okay. Camp Hood, Texas. It's just another part of the camp. Camp Hood, Texas, in the area, is one of the largest camps in the country. 24,000, 2,400 square miles, I believe. I think it's 24,000. I think it's 2,400 square miles. And on the other side of the camp, there was a tank unit actually being trained on the other end of the camp. And we used to have our war games playing against them with our anti tank guns and them. And at the end of September, the training was all over. We did two weeks of bivouac living uh, in the field instead of coming back to our bunks. And 
sleeping in these little pup tents and water up to our ears because all of a sudden they got the rainy season and the water was flowing all over the place, even marching in and out of the camp if it was up over our ankles, I remember. A continuation of your appreciation of the army. Oh, <laughs> if you want to call it yeah. that. So anyways, uh, at the end of September we completed all of the training and the, the uh, bivouacking and what have you. And uh, they gave us two weeks time to uh, go home with the family after your training. And after that you're to report to your division that was going to be a replacement to ship you overseas. After my two weeks I took another train ride I was down to Camp Dorn, Mississippi in another hellhole. And uh, because when I got there and the, met some of the other GIs that were there regularly, which was, this was a regular division uh, camp, the 63rd Division was uh, there working to get ready to go overseas. And I heard that a lot of the uh, GIs and everything would take off and uh, without permission, you know, a little like desertion, they called it. Once but they realized they were uh, headed to war, they decided that... I know, I think it was because of the conditions in the camp. Ah, okay. Because <laughs> it was really rough. Then uh, we uh, uh, took some more additional training there, and when I got down to... Uh, the uh, Camp Van Dorn, one of the miracles, first miracles of the being in the service happened, they put me in the medics. After all my training with anti-tank and riflemen, they made me a medic. What was the reason? Uh, they said they needed more medics than they did, needed riflemen at the time, and it was based on your IQ and the test that you had taken. Exactly. So, uh, one of my prayers was answered. I didn't have to carry a gun and try to kill people, which, uh, like I said, what I was really against. And the uh, training went on there, uh, getting the medical training. I had it about six weeks, all the different things on anatomy, how to uh, use syringes and tourniquets and uh, try to save the GIs uh, if, as you encountered them in the field. After the six weeks training, we got our orders to ship out to POE, New York. So board another train, they all the division, all together, um, all three regiments. And it took us two days because of another clunker of a train, and they only used the, the uh, main tracks when military trains or somebody else was on them. You not spend a lot of time on the side tracks. So we got up to Camp Shanks, New York, which is 30 miles north of uh, New York City, right on the Hudson River, real nice location. Except it was up in the mountains, and you had coal stoves in the inside of the uh, your barracks, and. Uh, it was November now, the first of November, and uh, the uh, idea there was just to wait until everything is, was put together, uh, putting in your time until you could uh, sh ship out. I guess other troops uh, from other regiments and other uh, divisions had to uh, get together while they were setting the convoy up in New York Harbor. Mm -hmm. So on the 23rd of November, we had our last meal, and it turns out it was the Republican Thanksgiving. And it was, that was the election year, and the Republican Thanksgiving and the Democratic Thanksgiving that year. I uh, had a nice uh, dinner there on the 23rd, that Thursday, and Friday morning early. We all boarded trains again and went down to New York City and uh, into the harbor where we uh, boarded all of the ships that had been prepared for us. I was uh, fortunate enough to get a uh, prior Caribbean cruise ship for, to go over. Only myself and eight other medics were put on it because this was a division headquarters ship. It was for the brass, and all they wanted was some medics on board. So accommodations were a lot better than being on a troop ship. They certainly were, and uh, the, uh, we took off out into the harbor. Convoy was to totally assembled. We headed south, just past Bermuda, and from there we made a left-hand turn right across the Middle Atlantic. Tell me a little bit about that ocean experience for being. Uh, you know. Well, that was fun. Well, like I said, it was on the, the cruise ship. It was the former Orient in the peacetime. They called it the uh, Barry, the Thomas H. Barry. Uh, they named it for wartime. And it was luxurious. I'd never seen such nice paneling from an 18-year-old that come from the east side, you know, 
down hill place. And with all those panelings, big staircases like they have in the, some of the ships today, well, only with a darker paneling. And it wasn't that large, but they did get 1,500 bid on it. It did accommodate 1,500 of the troops. And my accommodations were the, the hospital on the ship. The three of us, the corpsmen, we were in the, the hospital ward of the ship, so we, had, we used the patient bunks. So this was a, the luxury I spoke of. We, had to, we slept in the patient bunks, and we had a bath there in the tub. We could even take baths and everything. So that was uh, okay. The first two days I spent in that bunk. You talk about the trip. Well, none of us, we were all land lovers. And I'll tell you, the first two days, I was just lucky to keep my stomach where it belonged. And uh, after the second day, though, we got used to the waves and the rocking and everything, and then when we acquired our sea legs, I was able to get up and finally roam around the ship and everything, which was good, because on Thursday, the following Thursday, was the, the Democratic Thanksgiving, and again, we had a great big dinner set up for us you know, in the cafeteria that they had. The only difference about this cafeteria was something I'd never seen before. It was all tall tables. You stood at the table to eat. There was nothing for the enlisted men to uh, sit down like at a table or anything. So you stood at this bar with your tray, but the food was still good. No thing, uh, nothing uh, uh, else helped happen across the, the uh, Atlantic. It was a pretty good uh, Did you have trip. any idea where you were headed to? No, no idea. Matter of fact, uh, one of the things I, I liked about it was, that stood out though was when the, the uh, uh, cruise ships got it to uh, Canary Islands. Uh, because of the, this uh, cru uh, cruiser, I remember uh, the particular ship that I was on, was a big ship that took more fuel. So it broke away from the convoy with a dis one destroyer escort and circled around. We met a, a uh, tank ship that filled up and refueled it. And uh, we were all questioning some of the uh, seamen on the, the ship. Uh, what was the idea that we'd lose the rest of the convoy? They were way up ahead of us. They said, don't worry about it. They said, this, this thing could do 28 knots and could outrun any submarine or anything. We'll catch up to the rest of the convoy and nothing flat, which they did. They caught up to them just as we got into Gibraltar and the you know, Straits of Gibraltar going through to Africa and the Mediterranean Sea. And we got to see the lights of uh, uh, Nigeria and uh, uh, from uh, Africa and uh, Malta on the other side. We cruised right into the Mediterranean for a couple days, and then when we got to Corsica, we made a left-hand turn and headed north to Marseille, France. That was our destination. We arrived there on Pearl Harbor Day, December 7, 1944. So we stayed in the harbor till the rest of the, the uh, convoy uh, got in, got uh, hooked up. And then the next morning, December 8, 1944, we disembarked, and I had my first walk on foreign soil, and that was uh, interesting too. You just get a not feeling about this being away from home. Like I said, I was a naive 18 year old kid and all these things happened to me. And we went into town and they uh, put on, uh, put us on big trucks and hauled us out north of town where they'd set up a staging area until all of the troop ships could be emptied. And they called it the Delta staging area at that time. And we sat up in this mountain for about two weeks also. And the, the uh, no living accommodations. You're supposed to pitch your pump tent, but the place was just it was the top of a mountain. It was rocks. You just couldn't even uh, hammer your spikes into the ground to hold it. So the guys, uh, for, I don't know where they went, but they were did boxes and crates. And uh, I found a couple boxes someplace. I don't know where. And I, I put these down and put two of them together, and I could put my sleeping bag in it. I couldn't straighten out if they weren't that big but at least I was covered up. We uh, did this, like I said, for that period. Were, the, were you told that, uh, you know, this is a secure area, but stay alert because you could have... We didn't leave the area at all. Right. We stayed there the entire time until all the, uh, the regiments had assembled and ready to go. Then uh, the, uh, we got the notice that the troop trains were ready and everything were ready to ship up to the front. We, uh, I was put aboard a Fort Wolf, French 40 and 8 uh, railroad car, and it was another clunker from the First World War. Just like they said, 40 and 8, these small, you know, small wheel, those wheels and everything, and they just clanked along. 
and they squeeze 40 guys on there and put our luggage and bags uh, at either end of the car. And the first uh, night, uh, we all tried to lay down and everything to get some sleep while we rolled along. It was terrible. I managed to get up and crawl over the guys, and I went and slept on top of the bags and went into the car. And it turned to be better than uh, what I had. That, this lasted for two days until we got up to uh, a location. I don't remember the name of it, but it was a, a, a uh, former German uh, camp. It was in France, yet on the, the uh, west side of the Rhine River. We went through Sar Sarsburg, I remember, and uh, a couple other small towns, Nancy. But the name of this town is it's a foreign town. It's in my record someplace, but we spent a couple nights there. Along this trip, do you see any uh, devastation from the war? or Not really. The only devastation that uh, we encountered was right in Marseille. I don't know how they got the ships in the harbor. This was really shot up. There were a lot of sunken ships in the car harbor. The docks, a lot of the docks were shot up real bad. Uh, and I don't really, really figure out these ship guys. It must have been pretty good because they got wiggled in through there and were able to get us uh, disembarked. Did but you that was walk the only off or did you have to take a liberty launch? Well, we, we walked off. Okay. So they were at the dock side. And uh, the, uh, this just continued for the next couple of weeks going up the, the Rhine River uh, after the train ride. We'd, move uh, camp to camp along the river. We went up to Saarbrück and we were there for a couple of days and then we finally ended up in Sargemines, France, which was off on the Saar River, uh, came off of the uh, Rhine River. And there's where we stayed for a month and a half where again was a major assembly. And at this time then the, all the fighting was going up at uh, the Battle of the Bulge. In, in this trip that you, are you still doing some training or uh, you're not? None, no. Okay, you're just going for the ride waiting for orders. Correct. You're just making do with you got the best waiting until you get shoved off in it the, the day that they invaded the Germany. But the Battle of the Bolsch uh, was going on and so we stayed stable then because we were holding down the south end of the, the Seventh Army. Was That was the first army that had the encounter. And we were just south of them with the 7th Army. So I guess we were just holding things fast there to make sure there was no counterattack from this area. And then on the uh, 16th of February, at 3 o'clock in the morning, they came in uh, to uh, our rooms. Fortunately, one of the things when I say rooms, as the, the, medic, we, the medical team, you had uh, always took a building, a house or something, to set up. Uh, aid station. Mm -hmm. So we were always in a house or something. That was one of the benefits of being a corpsman. Only when you're stable, though, sitting still. As soon as you take off and into the battle zone, it's a different story. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, they said, leave everything, just get up and go. And that's what we did. We got up at 3 and they led us out uh, right over to the Sour River. And the uh, engineers had put up a single lane pontoon bridge quickly across the river. We marched across it behind the uh, B Company of the 250 Regiment that I was assigned to. It's up the bank at the far side onto some railroad tracks that was to lead us into Germany and around the town of Hanweiler, Germany, that they were surrounding and they were going to try to set up a position and take that uh, area. So up on the tracks we went and uh, staggered along for some reason or other. I ended up behind as the last man of this whole line of people. Everybody, the whole company, all ahead of me, the medic and the other uh, uh, guys that carried the, uh, I'm missing a word here. Uh, the medical equipment? Uh, the medical equipment, yeah. Stretchers? <laughs> the stretchers. See, that's at eight years of age. All okay. of a sudden these words were shaking. So the stretchers, but that was in front of me. The proctor from Arkansas was in front of me. He had the stretcher, and I was the last man. And here they are cruising along on this track. I'm nearsighted, as it turns out. This might be one of the other reasons I was made a medic, because uh, of my sight. And they said, don't step off of the ties. They got landmines and foot mines planted between the ties. So 
So I'm walking along at 4 o'clock in the morning with my head down almost to my nose to the tracks trying to see him with all of this fog and mist that was there. And they're cruising along at a good speed and I come to a spot and I see a hole. I mean, I actually see a big hole in the tracks, in the middle of the tracks. Uh-oh. So I thought, I, I don't want to step in there. So I stepped to the side over the track. I thought maybe I could step around it. Unfortunately, I was on a bridge and I fell off into a dry river bed. I was knocked out. I lost my helmet and equipment. I don't know how long I was knocked out, but uh, I came to and looked around. I still couldn't see anything, but I knew I was on the ground. So I scrambled up the embankment that I found, and I found the tracks again. And I hopped on the tracks, and I started running. And I didn't know if I was running back for a hand mile or if I was running the, where the troops were. I didn't know which direction I was running. But then about 10 or 15 minutes later, I caught up, and here's Proctor, the last guy with the stretcher, and uh, got up behind him. And I looked, and he didn't even know I was gone. So I didn't even say anything, not until we uh, got to the next action. We marched another hour, and all of a sudden got a little more daylight by 6 o'clock, and the machine gun fire opened up and from one side of us, and it was uh, some Germans spotted us on the tracks. So we all hit the tracks and uh, fell down face down so the rails might protect us, while the, one of the uh, platoons circled around to see if they could catch these guys from the back of the line the island before they killed us, which they did. But I'm laying there on the tracks and with no helmet or anything, and I reach over, here's a 30, gal 30 caliber machine gun uh, can. I pick up the ammunition, put it over my head to protect it. Of course, that was another dumb move because if a bullet ever hit it, I would have been gone anyways. So I might as well spend it without the helmet. And that's when I told them that I lost the equipment with uh, one of the guys there. But the, we didn't have any... Uh, sergeant or anybody with us. It was just the uh, medic man and the, the stretcher our crew behind the, the one company, B company. They were able to clear this out, so we got up and uh, proceeded on our uh, mission and a couple of miles more up the track or whatever the distance it was, and because it was hard to tell really. And they circled around and made their move around the, the city that they wanted to encircle. And it was across a big open field in the rainy season, the muddy holes and everything. It was really hard to um, march through. And with no longer, no sooner we get in there, and they say, uh, we got somebody, you got your first uh, casualty to uh, carry back. So we found this big Iowan, over 200 pound Iowan boy. And we threw him on the stretcher, and I had a, one of the back handles. And we started back with this big kid. And that, that was my first experience. He's still alive? Yes, okay. but he couldn't walk. He was shot up pretty well. And so we started back and we decided to take the same route back as we had come through this muddy field that was open and everything. And we no sooner got back up on a high dome there and a uh, mortar fire opened up on us. Some Germans on the other side of where we were encompassing saw us and opened up with us. And the first mortar landed, it was almost right on top of us. And uh, we had set the, this GI down for rest. We, he'd go, you know, 50, 100 yards, and he'd be so tuckered up, he'd set him down. And uh, when we said that first stop, the first mortar landed, all of a sudden the second mortar landed. We said, uh oh, got to get out of here because the third one was always on top of you. So we jumped up again and ran. I don't know how far again, but it wasn't too much because we were really beat carrying this big kid. And again, the mortar fire landed on top of us. Again, we had to get up and jump. We were still in open territory. This happened two or three times. And actually, the GI felt so sorry for us. He told us to leave him, run for our lives, and he didn't care, even though he couldn't get up and walk. It's really astounding that they get that kind of reaction from him. But no, we wasn't going to leave him. So we picked him up and ran again, and we finally hit the woods on the other side there towards the tracks and uh, got out of the fire. When we found the tracks, we just turned and we figured we had to fit, head to north on them, and we did. And we got back to uh, Sarga Mines and with this small bridge, we carried him across. I don't know how we managed that because I don't even remember any of it, truthfully. It's just like a blur 
but we got him over and the, the, uh, the jeep was there, picked him up and took him to the hospital. Then we turned around and went right back, marched back to the, find the uh, company again. And uh, as it turns out, somebody noted that this was quite an accomplishment the first day, and I was uh, given the Bronze Star along with the other stretcher bearers for this achievement. So you had a witness to this event, and they put you in for a Bronze Star? Correct. And uh, it was, we, I found out it was uh, two and a half miles, and it took us six hours to accomplish it, carrying this uh, GI back to safety. So that was one of the uh, small things that happened. But this didn't occur all the time, naturally. Uh, as it turns out, because there was a lot of pushing and everything and running, uh, it was only a, it might happen uh, once a week or something like that where you, you might really get into a situation like that. And that did occur several times under different circumstances. The, uh, one of them uh, was uh, the next time we got a call that there was a GI out in a foxhole uh, out in the middle of no man's land. And the chief found the uh, woods where we were to make our initial contact. We grabbed the, the litter and started off to the direction looking for the company. And uh, there were some GIs there that directed us to the location. And it turns out he was in a foxhole uh, 20 or 30 feet out in the middle of this open field. It was a high grass field. And the Germans were in the trees on the other side. So we crawled on our stomachs. We got down our stomachs with the uh, stretcher so they couldn't see us. Calls crawl through the uh, tall grass. When we got to the foxhole, we found our next uh, patient, and we reached in the foxhole, tried to lift him out to uh, put him on the litter. And he let out one hell of a scream. He was in pain, and the scream could be heard all over, but you could hear it for a mile. Well, the Germans heard it. So we picked him up, we just grabbed him, threw him on a stretcher, and got up and just ran again for the trees. And we no sooner got there in the tanks that there were tanks on the other side. We didn't realize it was just tanks and the, the Germans that were over there. And they opened up with their 88s. In this trees, this forest that I was in, the 88s actually cut off the top of the top of the trees firing at us. With, and they were, it's only personnel. But they, they leveled these trees. When we hit the, the, the trees and we heard the firing started, we fell on the ground face down, put the litter between us, the four of us. And we just laid there and waited until the firing and the gun, uh, all the guns stopped firing. And it must have been 15, 20 minutes. I had my nose right to the ground all that time. Matter of fact, all I, this wood and branches is all flying around it you? It sure was. So when the fire, firing stopped, all the shooting, we got up to uh, look around and get our patient. And here all around us was all these five foot, two to five foot splinters, all in the ground, all around us. Not one of us was hit, out of the five of us, none of us was hit. It looked like an outline of the, you know, where the, uh, some police outfit, when they were chalk lining you uh, for a dead person. But this was another time, uh, a good escape. We picked them up again and got them over to the Jeep, got back to safety again. Uh, next thing that happened. Uh, there were several things. Uh, St. Egbert's on March 16th, this is a month after we got started in. I was in combat exactly uh, 60 days, by the way, from February 16th to April 16th when I was captured. The, uh, on March 16th, we came into St. Egbert, which was right at the uh, uh, Maginot Line. We, we got broke through that, and again, the Germans were on the run. They didn't have to set up any line there, so we uh, came into town, found a uh, house to set up our aid station. Then uh, the next morning, since there was nothing going on, I took him uh, upon myself to walk into town and look around. And I was by myself for some reason. I don't know what, where the other uh, fellows in my group were. And I saw uh, a nice house. I was always interested in architecture of this and, and old houses and everything. I saw it look pretty neat. So I decided to go in, it was open, and I walked in around and it wasn't, it hadn't been touched as far as uh, firing or shells or anything else, the town looked, looked pretty clean. And I walked from room to room, there's nothing in it, just clean room, until I got to the uh, back bedroom. 
and there was the exception. There was a, a chest of drawers sitting right back in the corner, all by itself. And I started to walk over to the chest of drawers, and then I looked up, and there was a closet in this uh, uh, bedroom. And I saw something on the shelf uh, in the closet. So I directed myself away from the chest of drawers up to the closet, and I found uh, one of my souvenirs. It was uh, several photo albums, Ger German pro propaganda albums, which they, what they were. They were really great. They were in this uh, kaleidoscope, or what do you call it? I think it was kaleidoscope. Mm -hmm. The double pictures with the lenses and everything. So I grabbed a hold of them, letting them have room for anything else. I had two big albums and some loose pictures I put under my arms, and I headed back to the aid station. I no sooner got the aid station, the, the sergeant uh, reprimanded me. He's, he's told me, you're not supposed to look for souvenirs because they might have uh, mines or stuff, uh, something stuck there. A booby trap or something. Booby trap, correct. And uh, I said, you're right, sorry. I said, I have to watch myself. But he let me keep them, and I just took them, put them in a the box, and shipped them home. Uh, and not uh, an hour later, we're there, and uh, they're bringing a, a GI that's wounded. And he's got both his hands blown off. And we asked what happened. He says, I went into a nice house down in the main street there, and he says, I found a, a uh, cabinet uh, dresser in the back, and I opened one of the drawers and blew off his hands. So that dresser was booby trapped that I had walked away from another time. Someone was looking over you. Somebody was looking over me. I just can't believe it. So we proceeded to push it again for uh, another two weeks until Sunday, Easter Sunday, as it turns out, April 1st of 45. We were in uh, Heidelberg, Germany. Do you have any idea that the war is winding down? Oh, you could tell because you're you're running now. They're running and you're running. Behind the chase. Right. We don't have that much action, actually, uh, for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I was having very little encounters with some but GIs that we had to take care of and uh, send back. And uh, we would see that naturally, being the only aid station for that uh, regiment. But we got into Heidelberg and uh, they told us that it was an open city. They never had this before. It was one of the weirdest things I've ever encountered as a soldier. You're walking into town, and uh, we set up in another house, empty house, but all the civilians are there. I mean, and, and the German soldiers are all walking around. They're in uniform, and the civilians all around. They're at their stores shopping. They're in the streets lined up trying to get food or something at different stores. And we're walking around and looking at them. They're looking at us, and it was just an odd feeling. I think it was weird. War is weird. And uh, so we did that for just for that day. We were, the idea was that we were supposed to uh, <clears throat> get everything cleaned up, uh, get new supplies and what have you, uh, before taking a more uh, direction to chase the Germans again. So we were only there that one day. We, uh, you think it was because Heidelberg was a hands-off area? <clears throat> Let's not destroy this city? Uh, well, they just made an agreement because there, there was this medical school there. Oh. And, uh, and it was the, the college that was there. And, uh, they just felt they didn't want to blow it up because it would still be utilized. Right. And uh, I guess that was the reason. To me, it was odd. <clears throat> like I said. So you stayed there a day and now. Well, the next morning, we take off again. We get, at this time now, the medical group, we have uh, our own. Uh, we had a three quarter ton and a couple trailers and a Jeep that was assigned to us. And we were all able to climb on and scramble and, and uh, travel with this without walking and marching. So we took off across the, the uh, river there. Uh, I forget which river it is. But they had another pontoon bridge across it. We had to cross to get over to, <coughs> to continue our march. <coughs> Gentlemen, it's getting dry talking. <coughs> Take your time. What's your whistle? <coughs> so, um, Another odd thing occurred then, this was a funny thing. Uh, as we were taken off and following the convoy on this road going further into Germany, we noticed that some of the jeeps and the trucks were doing weave like this. Uh-oh, uh what happened here? And a few miles down the road we found out that uh, a lot of these guys, uh, my fellow combat soldiers, had found wineries and beer stalls in the uh, Heidelberg, which was a brewery town, and they threw out a lot of their supplies and they 
besides drinking most of it, they had... They were partaking in the spirits of the area. They sure did. <clears throat> and they loaded up their trucks with it, too. <clears throat> so there was a few demotions and everything, but nothing else. <clears throat> uh, if you're going to have to forgive me, oh, I'm really at my dry point now. <clears throat> I think it was the hockey game last night. <clears throat> so nothing else happened um, as we proceeded until the 16th of April, Monday morning. We got another call that there was a wounded GI out at B Company, and uh, after breakfast we were to uh, go out and see if we could find him and bring him back. We uh, went to the Jeep, and when we get to the Jeep to take off, our sergeant come, has decided he's going to come with us on this trip because there's not a lot of action back at the aid station, and also the First Lieutenant Jordan who was uh, the MEC officer and helped out as a medical officer in the aid station. And plus the uh, driver and the litter crew. So seven of us are stacked in this Jeep as we take off into the woods uh, looking for B Company. And we no sooner get into the woods than the nice black top road going through the mountains and the, the woods and where, the, where this is. We uh, sight some Germans we uh, saw. They were stripped out of their waist. They were in a water uh, tank off to our 200 yards to our right in front of a farmhouse washing up. The Jeep driver slammed on the brakes and we all said, well, let's capture these Germans here. Uh, we can take care of them while we're going in to get this uh, wounded guy. Well, it turns out these guys aren't going to be captured. They saw us. As quick as we saw them, they hightailed it into the farmhouse, and we, instead of taking it off, we sat there waiting for them to come out. Well, they came out also with the rest of their crew, another company, and they all machine, with machine guns, and, and they're blazing away at us. So now you're outnumbered. Oh, were we outnumbered? Seven medics here with all we got is a litter to fight with. Was there a radio contact back to the... No, no radio contact. We didn't have that. Okay. Is there a reason? Uh, uh, they didn't have it then. Okay. No. So, uh, uh, they fired upon us. Like I said, they almost got the Jeep in half. Fortunately, uh, none of us were wounded. Uh, the, the worst thing that happened was the, the sergeant got the, one of the shells, went between his glasses and his nose here. He skinned a little bit of his nose. But uh, they yelled, uh, you know, surrender. You know, and uh, we threw up our hands. They said, March out Octonian or Clare, and uh, that was it. I was captured. Uh, in your uniform and on your Jeep, don't you have a, the uh, medic Red Cross? Oh, yeah. Uh, and so on our helmets and everything, and we had the armbands. Yeah. So we you're, all wore these you're really bands. a non threatening type of. Uh, right. And they saw that as soon as we got, we got close to us. They didn't realize it from the distance that they were. So the, they took us, and when they saw we were medics, they had us drive the Jeep underneath the some trees to hide it, and uh, the rest of the crew come out and he marched us back to their company headquarters where they proceeded to interrogate all of us. Uh, he sat us down alongside a fence. The, the interrogation point was a farmhouse in this little town uh, through the next echelon uh, station back. And one at, one, at a, one at a time they took us into the farmhouse and uh, questioned us. My turn came, and they took me in, and the, it was a bare farm. There wasn't much furniture in it, but there was a table and a chair in the kitchen. They sat me down on the chair while one of the Germans stood over me with a gun and the, the other one in front of us doing an interrogation. And he's, his English was very good. And he's proceeded to tell me uh, who I was, my rank, and everything else, and where I was from. And, oh my God, he said, somebody really spilled the beans. You're only supposed to give your name, rank, and serial number. So, uh, that really confused me. And he wanted to know more and more, though he kept questioning, and I told him I didn't know anything. Uh, he said, I'm just a poor uh, medic, you know, we don't get in and all the action. All I do is retrieve wounded. He, and uh, for some reason then he says, well, you know, uh, we're losing a lot of good men because of you guys. And I says, good. And all of a sudden I get a whack in the head from a rifle about the back of me, almost knocked me out. They said, that's enough of you, and they marched me out. And uh, the interrogations were over. And they marched us back then to division headquarters. I guess it's a division. That's the way I look at it. What were your feelings at that time? Uh, 
I thought it was dead. I, you know, you don't have to say I was nervous or anything, man. I, I was at the point of, of breaking. I mean, this whole war thing uh, already had me over the edge as far as I was concerned. I don't know how I kept myself together. Uh, I was so uh, shook up and afraid of what was going on. Like I told you in the beginning, I was glad to be a medic so I didn't have to fire a gun. Well, I didn't want to be on the other end either. And I thought this was the end. And they marched us back and uh, interrogated us again at a, another point. And after that, another took us back at another point and interrogated us. And by then it was dark at the end of the day and they uh, stuck us in a barn at a farmhouse, uh, wherever it was, because this was all marching at this time now. And uh, all of a sudden the barn door opened and uh, a couple of Germans came in, the squad, and the first the one uh, was the, had, a, had a... Okay, let me flip this tape over. So the uh, um, German came in, with one of them was holding an ant lantern, so he had some light in there. And this German proceeded to ask or call out names, he called out Lieutenant Jordan's name first. And he said, you go over there by the fire door. Then he called off another name, and nobody responded to it that was there. Uh, of those, there was only the seven of us. No response, and he said it again. And then he came over and slapped me. And he says, "Don't you know your own name?" I says, "It didn't sound like Shire to me." He says, "Get over there with the lieutenant." And then they walked out with the two of us and left the others in the barn and marched us off. And I don't know where they took Lieutenant Jordan and I, but it was someplace where we stayed the night, probably another farmhouse. And the next morning, uh, they woke us up and got us and took us out in a nice new uh, Mercedes. Uh, Convertible, a 1936 real nice job. Any clue to why as to why you were selected? Yes, as it turns out, I found out that as a courtesy, all officers always had an aide with them, and I was a selected aide to uh -huh. Lieutenant Jordan as an officer. Any picture because of? They have got the foggiest. Were you the youngest? Uh, I could have been. Okay. I mean, I, and I, it may have been a reason. Right. I really don't know why they picked me. Okay. Uh, because of. To me, they're all the same, you know, just a bunch of medics. So uh, that was one promotion I didn't, I didn't mind, uh, even if I was going to get shot. <laughs> so they, we hopped into the, this Mercedes convertible. They picked us up in the morning. We didn't know why, but all of a sudden they drove to another farm, and they took us into this farmhouse. Uh, there was only another German guard in the, in the driver of this uh, Mercedes. They marched us in to a back room, and here's this gentleman sitting here and it turns out he's an army officer and he's in a gray tattered uniform the thing looked like it was from the, from the Civil War I, I don't know what the, the German would, would, would be but it was a German general and he was the major officer for the that core Army Corps and all he wanted to do was question Lieutenant Jordan about new medical practices and what was the latest thing through the interpreter that they had with him and after he talked to, with Lieutenant Jordan for a while and got his questions and everything, they said, well, that's all, uh, back you go. So they turned around and then took us, uh, marched us out, and took us to a location where they gather all the uh, prisoners of war and march you to the camp where you're going to be staying with, concentration camp. And it turns out there was only seven of us. There was a couple of uh, airmen from uh, the uh, British Air Force and a couple of flyers uh, there was uh, two uh, American airmen, myself and Lieutenant Jordan, and a, a GI from uh, the 7th Army who had escaped from another prison camp and they re recaptured him again. I don't want to get too far ahead in the story, yeah. but do you have any recollection what happened to those other five uh, gentlemen I didn't find that out the bar? I didn't find out until I was home after the war. You know, uh, Captain Whalen, who was in charge of the aid station, who was uh, our superior officer, there was Captain Whalen, Lieutenant Jordan, the sergeant, and the rest of us. He uh, uh, wrote a letter to all of us uh, and told us that uh, they were recovered uh, a few days later. Uh, the uh, third uh, 
division and to outrun the, the Germans again, caught up with them, the ones that had them, and released them. So they were recovered safe. So they were recovered safe, okay. right. Now, let's go back to your experience in the That's concentration right. so, camp. So we started marching back. They, t uh, they had us at this location, the seven of us, like I said, where they picked up prisoners. And there's a company of Wehrmacht Army, the German Army, that is their job to march you back to the next camp or wherever you to be uh, taken. And I don't know how they assigned it. They naturally were really in on that. But all of a sudden, we're marching uh, every uh, night. Uh, they picked us up at night and we marched at night. And there was about 30 or 40 of them. And they're all old men. I found out that these were all guys that were too old to fight at the front and everything. And they gave them this job to take the prisoners back. And they didn't even all have guns. You know, some of the guns they had had broken stocks and barrels. And I don't even know what the, what the reason for even bothering with it. And the only equipment they had was a World War I flatbed wagon with a horse to pull it. And that's all they had to carry all their equipment and everything, and us marching behind it with the, the men in the squad, the 30 or whatever it was, uh, of these Wehrmacht Army guys. And of course, when I said old men, I found out they were just 40, 45, terrible. But the war had taken its toll. Oh, huh? well, well, definitely. And uh, we uh, marched that night, as I said, in the daytime. They would, the first farm that they came to, they would throw us in the barn, and it's, they would stay in there where they could watch us. We'd keep us in the barn because we were afraid of the, uh, at that time, the P-47s were strafing and doing a lot of bombing. Uh, of the troops. Could you hear the airplanes? Uh, yes. Could you hear any other war going on, the no, shelling? No, none. The only thing I heard was uh, the P-47s. A couple times they flew overhead, we uh, heard them. And uh, that was the extent of it. Uh, I guess we were just far enough back each time as we marched, and that's the reason they were running. Well, then we found out that they were just running past one camp to the next because the Americans were right behind them. They didn't want to stop. And a week into uh, this running with them. Uh, the SS uh, was encountered, and the, the officer of the SS talked to the Wehrmacht officer that had us and said, uh, this is ridiculous, uh, keeping these guys, uh, you're feeding them and everything, and carrying me along, it's just slowing you up. Uh, let us have it, we'll take them off your hands and get rid of them for you. Well, the Wehrmacht officer said, no way, his responsibility, and he was very adamant about it, and for some reason or other, he was adamant enough that the SS took off and left us. And we continued to march with this uh, Wehrmacht group uh, uh, until the day of our release, uh, the, uh, which occurred uh, in another week. And we, in the, uh, From your experience, you believe that was a life-saving decision, that Wehrmacht? Uh, yes, we found out uh, the day that we were released that he was talking to, uh, to our officers that the only reason he kept us was as hostages in case he came upon uh, American troops or some, so he'd have something to bargain with. And, and as it turned out, it, it worked. Uh, we got to uh, the point where we were in Germany, I found out the name of the town, and uh, told our officers that this was it, we're not going any further. They just got word that the Russians were right in front of us over the next ridge. and. Uh, he said, we're not going any further. So the officer said, well, why don't you just surrender us and we'll turn around and go back. And the German said, no, he said, that's not enough protection. He said, i got to have some protection for my men in that. Uh, so uh, they uh, agreed that there was a, uh, a Polish POW working this one farm, the last one we stopped at. He said, let's send him out and see if we can get a hold of some American troops someplace and bring them in to help us out here, which they did. And the next morning, May 1st, was POW, Polish POW showed up in the 3rd Division, uh, Audie Murphy's outfit, as a matter of fact. And they uh, completed the surrender. The uh, Germans, the Wehrmacht, uh, uh, took them, threw their guns, guns down on the ground in a big pile and marched over with the 3rd Army, uh, uh, I mean the 3rd Division GIs. And they uh, started up a conga line and marched them away and left us there uh, waiting for a, we found out a two and a half ton pickup truck that any recovered uh, POWs, they picked them up immediately and took them, uh, tried to go back to a, 
special camp they set up in Mannheim, Germany. Well, we got in the truck and started back. And uh, before we did that, though, that, that pile of guns, I picked through it. And uh, I found the uh, seven lace pistols that I stuck in my coat and pockets and everything else that I brought home with me. And a couple of nice swords, or daggers, I should say. And halfway through, well, it wasn't even half, it was 60 miles later. It was 30 miles to Munich and then 30 miles past Munich, northeast, on this main highway we were taking back to Mannheim. All of a sudden the truck stopped. The canvas top was over over us and we were sitting in the back, all of us. And it stopped and I don't know why, but the truck driver came around and said, uh, I want to run into this uh, the concentration camp. It was just uh, relieved like yesterday. Uh, another uh, division, uh, uh, what do you call it, rescued it and uh, all of the, let all of the prisoners go. And he wants to go in and take a look at it. So we said, well, okay, you can go ahead, you know, if you're that anxious to see the damn place. So he uh, ran in and all the other guys all of a sudden took off with all the other prisoners I was with. They all jumped out of the truck and followed them into the camp. We were at the main gate on the main highway going into the camp. And I sat in the truck. I was still too nervous to do anything. I'm waiting for another counterattack to be captured. I mean, I was scared, frightened. And I wasn't moving until I got back and safe behind our lines. Well, I waited, waited, all of a sudden, they're not coming back. And I don't know how long it might have been, a half hour, an hour. So I stuck my head out of the back of the, the truck and looked around, and I didn't see anything. So I jumped out of the truck and walked over to the gate and looked around. I didn't see anything right there. And then I happened to look down the fence line. I had a big iron crate fence all in front of the place. And I looked down, and I see something like hands or something or arms. So I walked down there, nearsighted again. I had to walk all the way down and see what it was. Here it was, it was still a bunch of uh, the concentration camp prisoners. They were still alive, but you wouldn't know it. The skulls had nothing but just skin on them, the eyes, you know, blank and everything, and the rags hanging on their bodies, and it was just bones with skin on it. And it just was an awful sight. And I mean, I broke down. I just turned around and ran right back and got back in the truck. And being a medic, your heart had no oh, medical supplies. You couldn't do anything for them. I couldn't do anything for them. So I don't know why they hadn't left if they were free, you know, I, well, they couldn't left. They probably could hardly walk. You know, they were hanging onto the fence. But like I said, I, well, to this day, when I think about it, it just brings tears to me. It's terrible. Well, the guys finally came back and got in the, the uh, truck, started back, and they said this was Dachau. And oh, they got a, out of here. Dachau sends a chill through my bones. Somebody heard that I was at Dachau, and they gave me a pin. I got a Dachau pin. And uh, we finally got back to Mannheim, Germany. Uh, late in the day, was found out it was a 200-mile ride from where I was released as a prisoner. And it was a, a large camp that they'd set up. They must have thousands of guys in there. And they were processing them, getting them all ready to uh, send back and ship back to the States. But the first thing they did to us is when we got off the truck is they marched us into a big canvas tent, I mean a great big one, it must have been 40 by 60, and the GIs were in there with hoses and dust powder, they made a strip at one end, take everything off we had, throw it down to a pile to be burned, then they marched us through and deloused us and what have you, and we marched us out, out the other side and uh, gave us all new clothes and to wear. The only thing that uh, we kept was our shoes and my the badge that I had and my armband and my dog tags and my scissors. I, I had those on me and actually my prayer book I had also. They let us keep that. Uh, I don't know why. I guess because it, they didn't figure it could be the louse or whatever. But uh, all new clothes and everything. And it's assigned us to a barracks with uh, all our new equipment. And we found out that that's what they did. They uh, The next day when we went for medical, they uh, gave us all new uh, physicals checked us out and told us that uh, they'd be staying here until uh, we had uh, everything set up to ship us back to the States. Well, the war hadn't ended because this was the first of May, actually the second day when I had the physical, and we stayed in camp. I wasn't going to wander around. We're in the middle of Germany and I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so uh, uh, nothing occurred there. It was. Uh, just a quiet 
until the uh, 7th when we got word that the Germans had surrendered and the signing would be the next day, May 8th. So then everything lit up. The city lit up. All of a sudden there were civilians all over the place. It was just like peacetime again. And uh, so that was a big relief to me. But I had one more scare before I left that camp. I uh, only kept a, uh, three or four of the guns that were decent to, to bring home. The others were the wrecks that were left over from the war, the guys that uh, kept them out of desperation or what, the uh, German uh, soldiers. And I was showing a 25 caliber Beretta to a, a green GI that had just come in as a replacement was there. And I guess he didn't know anything about little guns because all of a sudden he pulled the trigger and we're in this we were in the lunchroom with 200 GIs eating lunch, and this bullet was right by my head, and it bounced around this hall. The bullet actually flew around the hall, you hear it bouncing off of each wall, and I grabbed that thing away from him and put it in my pocket, and this dumb thing, I said, man, I escaped again. So as soon as I got home, I took the firing pin out of that thing and the trigger, because I figured it was, I don't know if it was just him or it was just a... Very touchy weapon. Touchy weapon is right, because... Uh, the GIs uh, and the Germans must have did the same thing. They modified a lot of their guns to make them quicker on the trigger. They, uh, so uh, take the safety feature off so they get the quicker firing power. Well, after uh, a couple weeks there, another week after the war ended, we fi finally got the word that uh, things were ready for the next group to be uh, taken uh, home. And on the 16th of May, we boarded an old uh, DC-3. This was made in a troop carrier. This was one of the earlier planes, that, you know, as you can imagine, the DC-3. It uh, wasn't that big. We just had bucket seats on each side of the, the plane to sit on. You, and your parachute was your cushion. You sat on the parachute. And they flew us from Mannheim, Germany, to uh, La Havre, France. In La Havre, France, I got to see it uh, from the air when they flew into the airport, and it was really shot up. I mean, you talk about, I don't know how they could get a ship in there. The docks and everything were all blowing up from uh, D-Day when they uh, came in from uh, England on uh, June the 6th. Uh, one of the things I missed on this flight, the uh, captain of the, sh the airplane knew who they were and what was going on, and as a courtesy, he took a low flight over Paris to show us Paris as we were coming back to La Havre, but unfortunately uh, I was so beat, I fell asleep on the plane, I never saw it. I was asleep on the plane for the, <laughs> the plane ride back to La Havre. We uh, got off the plane and immediately put right on the ship. They took us right to the harbor and put on the ship. And it was a Liberty ship, one of the original Liberty ships that Kaiser built in, in Oregon. It, uh, you'd only get 300 of us souls on that thing. And it was also a berry. This time it was the William T. Berry. We uh, sta stayed in the, uh, in the harbor until it was loaded. And then we uh, got the ship going and they took us over to Southampton, England. And I found out this was the where they were going to wait for the rest of the uh, convoy to be assembled. And two days later on the 18th of May, the convoy had assembled and we took off across the North Atlantic. They chose the North Atlantic um, because they had less submarine problems there because all of the German submarines hadn't been accounted for as yet. And we were heading over towards Nova Scotia. But halfway across, uh, we got word that the last submarine had been accounted for and all restrictions were taken off. The boats and everything were able to put on all of the running lights and when you looked out to the ship, all of the ships in the convoy, it looked like a parade coming down Broadway with all the lights lit up on the Atlantic Ocean. It was really a beautiful sight. And from then on, it was just, everything was easy. Uh, although there was a lousy ride on this Liberty ship, I mean, because we were hitting some real rough waves uh, coming across the North Atlantic. But again, we had got our, gotten our sea legs and it wasn't a problem. I mean, we were hitting 30 foot dips and everything. Along with getting further away from the devastation that you had seen. Absolutely. But, and let me stop you there for a second. I, you know, one of the interesting questions that we like to ask is, how did you stay in touch with your family back here in, in Michigan and uh, loved ones and uh, 
your uh, brothers uh, while you were there in Germany. Did you have some kind of uh, contact we, we with did. them? Yes. As a matter of fact, I don't know how I got it it's all in, but we wrote email letters. We got those sheets that uh, the free stamps on it and just folded mm -hmm. all up. And uh, I must have did a lot of it because when I got home, my mother kept all of those letters. Oh, fantastic. And uh, I still have them. Uh, I didn't mean but, to interrupt uh, you, but I no, just... That, no, that is a good point, because the, that was the only contact, the, was the, the letters. I had no other contact from the time I left uh, Van Dorn, Mississippi, to ship overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, I never contacted my family at all, uh, except for the, the letters that I wrote to them. And uh, I did write one to her from New York when I was there just uh, a couple days before we shipped out. And you did have mail calls, so you could receive something yes. from them that might have been a couple months old. That is correct. But, uh, um, there was a few of them. We did get a few. Because most of the time, like I said, the Germans were retreating so fast and we were running so much after them that uh, it was hard catching up to us. Uh, but we did have a few. Okay, well, let's get back to your ship now. You're coming okay. in New York Harbor? Right. We uh, rode into the, the Canadian coast. You could see Nova Scotia from the ship. And then we headed down the coastline, uh, past Long Island, into uh, New Jersey. We, uh, uh, all the ships went into Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. That's where we unloaded. And uh, as soon as uh, the GIs got into a camp, the first thing they did was run for the phones to call home. And I wasn't one of the first ones that waited because there was such a lineup and everything, so I just waited until the evening. And then I went in and called my mother. And uh, there were free phones. This was another thing. There was a lot of free stuff that they set up for us, and this is one of the things that the Red Cross had set up. You just grab any phone and make any call any place you wanted. So I got a hold of my mother and talked to her, and she was shocked as all hell because she only got the telegram the day before that I was captured. She hadn't received the telegram saying that I had been released and coming home, and she didn't get the didn't have the letter yet from the War Department saying I was on my way home. She got that the week after that I made the call. So quite a surprise and a heartwarming right. Right. smile on her face. Yep. And they, they started asking me a lot of questions, this and that, and where was they? And my dad accused me of taking off. He said when I was missing an action, he accused me of taking off with some fraud line, <laughs> which is no way because uh, I wasn't, uh, I never even dated or anything. I, I was so, like I said, introverted and everything. I never, I've never had a date. Uh, so. Uh, we were there just for uh, one day, it was the 4th of June this was, so I was out, at, uh, out on seas for 16 days for our trip back. And uh, we boarded a train again for Fort Sheridan, Illinois, where, where I was inducted. And the reason for this is, you, uh, anybody in that area as a prisoner of war, you were sent home, but they sent it you know, home through the location uh, from where you lived. So I got my orders there and I was given a 66 day leave. Now that's what the, the you know, POWs got. And then I found out they can't send you back in the, into a war zone as a PW. Uh, unless you, if you had enough points to be discharged, you would dis discharge. Well, I only had a, a year's service in. So I couldn't get discharged. So I had to stay someplace. I came home, did my 66 days with the family and everything, running around. Actually, after a while, it, it got boring. It not doing a heck of a lot except going downtown to the clubs. I liked the music. Music was my big thing. If I wasn't in the show, I was at uh, one of the clubs listening to the music all, all over town. Uh, a couple times I would go downtown to the, uh, the uh, camp, the uh, places for the GIs down there, the USO clubs. And there was a couple of them downtown Detroit that I uh, frequented and uh, I would do that at night. So finally, I have to head back. They, they told me that uh, I would have to uh, go to Camp Crowder, uh, Missouri, where uh, there would be a second reassignment. So after my 66 days, oh, excuse me, I missed something. If there's something in between Camp Crowder and there, I had to go for rehabilitation, R&R, &R, at Arlington Hotel in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And I took the train to uh, Little Rock, and then we had to catch a bus uh, into the, the hotel. And they gave us two weeks of R&R. &R. You have your own room there. And they got a jukebox going 24 hours a day with you no know, nickels you had to put in. And they had a soda bar there with uh, uh, 
loads of malted milks and hamburgers and everything. And uh, I wasn't a drinker, I never drank. I never smoked in my life. So uh, I lived at the bar there with hamburgers and malted milks. Uh, and that was just for the two weeks. There was a few days when they take us out to some things would come up. They had tours of some clubs, women's clubs or what have you, take you out trips into the mountains or show you some some sites around Arlington. Uh, I never used the hot spots though. They had their own hot spots in these hotels. But I never used one. I don't know why. I guess I didn't want anything to do with this funny water again after the salt water of the ocean. <laughs> but you're still a medic. I'm still a medic. And uh, this is when they send you from there to Camp Crowder for reassignment. Well, being a medic, and again, they want you to be the closest place to home, so they, the closest place to Detroit was Percy Jones Hospital in Battle Creek. So after uh, two weeks there, I was assigned to uh, Percy Jones. Again, they put, it, put us on the train. And uh, I looked at, there's four of us that turns out were from the Detroit area, and so they shipped us together. And the four of us are looking at our papers, which I have in here, by the way. I have those two. And there's no time arrival for Percy Jones. I says, why don't we just stay on the train one right back into Detroit? And we looked at each other, fine. So we took off and went right back into Detroit for another two weeks. And uh, one of the guys that we went in with had his own car and it was at home. So he picked up the car and after two weeks we hopped in, the, uh, got in his car and drove back to Battle Creek and reported uh, in October to uh, Percy Jones. And we walked into the office there, the day officer, officer of the day as it turns out. He looked at us and he says, guys, he says, this is bad news. He says, I don't have any place to stick you. I didn't know you were coming. He says, uh, have you guys been on leave lately or anything? We said, no, we haven't had a furlough. <laughs> And he turned around and gave us two weeks furlough and we turned around and got in the car and drove back home. <laughs> so home again. Actually, I was in the service 720 days and I spent 340 of home. Wow. Wow. Yeah, but that was the good part. See, the first part was hell over there, but when I got home I made it good. And uh, so I got back to Percy Jones then after our two-week leave and uh, assigned to, I got assigned to the nut ward on the third floor of Percy Jones, locked ward. But a lot of the guys in there were there. They were fellows that had, had sustained head wounds or something. Was this a VA hospital? Yes. Okay. It's, it's still, well, it isn't anymore. It's now the federal building in Battle Creek. They took it over uh, after some years, but it's, it remained a VA hospital for many years. The uh, third floor was a locked ward. We had uh, one alcoholic. We had two polio patients in wheelchairs. And we had one GI uh, lady that had a little venereal trouble, and they kept her in a separate room up in front. But uh, the locked ward, you went in with back to back. You didn't walk in there unless there was somebody at your back in the front. Gee, something happened, because every once in a while, one of these guys would just blow his top, and you'd have to subdue him. And actually, being one of the biggest guys there, I didn't realize that. Uh, at 5'11 and 175 pounds. What I would do is when one of them had an attack, they'd call in the nurse. There was a nurses assigned it for each shift. Uh, for us, we only had two shifts, uh, 12 hours. But I was assigned with one nurse. And some, one of these guys flew the stack. I jumped into bed with him. It was my job to jump into bed with him. And I actually wrestled him down, tie his arms down to his feet, and I'd have him in the hole wrestling him there in bed. Then the nurse could come in and give him a, a shot to set it to, 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 to quiet him down. And that was the, the main thing. That didn't happen too often, just a few times. So you're due to get out of the Army real short time period. The, uh, the points were adding up. But at Christmas time, one of the things we all bought when we were on the Rhine River at one time at Christmas when I heard these Germans over on the other side of the Rhine River singing Christmas carols and everything that we understood in German, all those guys we vowed that Christmas of 45, we wanted to be home. That was our was our program. And uh, so as it turns out, I told the, the uh, officer in charge at the hospital, I said, how about uh, a week off, you know, to uh, go home? He said, okay. So. Uh, I got a week's leave and I came home. And while I was home, I went to a New Year's Eve party with uh, some people up in Hamtramck. 
And as it turns out, I was, a, like I said, a non-drinker. So the party was dull for me at this place. Uh, and we were getting ready to leave. There was a Navy guy uh, at the party, too. And we decided to leave at the same time. And uh, he didn't want to take anybody home. He had his dad's nice new 40, 1940 Dodge. And he's, that's why he didn't drink. He didn't want to have anything because his dad told him to get that car home. When he saw I was sober too, he says, come on, he says, I'll take it to the streetcar, take me over, clean over to Joseph Campos' streetcar so I could get home. So we got in the car and the, the thing was loaded with frost. We, had, we got out and looked at the windows and he just scraped a little bit off the window where he could see out. And we took off down Knef and when we got to Joseph Campo, he had enough sight where he saw the streetcar just go by and it dismissed it. But this is the morning after in the New Year's Day. He said, I'll get to catch it for you. Well, he made a swift left-hand turn right in front of an oncoming bus. Oh. Smashed the hell out of his dad's car. We ended up through the double doors of the Cunningham drugstore in the corner. When I came to, they dragged me out and put me on the, the curb, and I was bleeding like hell. The face, I was all cut up, and went through the windshield, or hit the windshield. And he was sitting on the curb there crying his eyes out because he had his dad's car all right. And, but in a couple of minutes, an ambulance came along and picked me up and took me over to St. Francis Hospital, where the nurse spent two hours digging glass out of my face. They sewed me up and put a sling on my arm, and it, it, my arm was uh, banged up. And I came home, I got a taxi cab, and came home, and uh, the family saw me and everything. They cleaned me up, cleaned the cut, uh, all of the uh, blood off of my uniform. This is New Year's Day now. And I said, well, I got to report back, you know, in a couple of days. I went one more last, last dance at the Vanity Ballroom. I used to go to the Vanity Ballroom all the time. I didn't dance much when I went, but now I did. After I got in the service, I got a little bit more nerve, and I didn't get enough nerve to ask a girl to dance. But when they saw me come in there, they saw my face all patched up in the single way, or I guess they felt sorry for me, and they all danced with me. I danced the night away. That's New Year's Day. When I got back to the hospital then, after that, uh, come back in, and they saw me, the officer of the day, he says, no more day shift for you. From now on, you're 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, you can't be lifting and wrestling with patients with that. So I got the midnight shift. And what I would do then is uh, you come in, check with the nurse. And I was the only uh, supervision on the, the ward then at night, uh, except for some wax that helped me out. And at 7 o'clock, you come in, check in, get to find out if there's anything new with any of the patients. And then uh, 10 o'clock was bed check. The whack and I would go around and give them juice and whatever at night before we tucked them in the bed. And that was, that's all I did then until uh, the uh, April. In April, the paper came around and said uh, uh, all those eligible for uh, discharge, you had enough points, was on the list. And then I start counting. May, May 1st, I got enough points now. I got the 24, and my name wasn't on the list. So I took the list and rushed right into the officer of the day. I said, wait a minute. I said, looks like I'm due with May 1st here, and my name's not on the list. He says, you're right, Bill. Put my name on the list. That was it. So I had uh, two weeks to clean up everything there in Battle Creek at the hospital. And the last day, that, that night of April 30th, the, the rest of the guys on my ward that we hang around with at the hospital all the time, we took off and went into town and had the last big dinner together. No drinking or anything, just a nice big dinner. And we came out of the restaurant and we're standing on the saying, sidewalk saying our last goodbyes to each other when a command car pulls up with a couple of MPs and they look at us and they jump out of the car and you're all under arrest. What? For what? You don't have your hands on, you're out of uniform. We still had them in our belts, we hadn't taken them out of our belts when we walked out of the restaurant. Well, we put up a hell of a fuss and everything, but it didn't do any good. They stuck the four of us in the command car and took us to Camp Custer and shoved us in the brig. Well, we weren't in there long because, uh, again, the officer of the day of the brig came in and talked to us and found out we were all being discharged the next morning at Fort Sheridan. This was just a goodbye. And Mr. He said, yeah, this is crazy. He said, get out of here. <laughs> Let us go <laughs> out of the prison, uh, Another lock up. No. Fantastic army experience. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was. And that's what I had. So I uh, went back and got all my things the next morning, hopped on the train for Fort Sheridan, Illinois. 
got my discharge papers on May 1st. So it was exactly two years from the day that I got my papers that I was inducted, a year from the day I was released as a prisoner of war to the discharge May 1st. Let's, let's talk about some of the memorabilia that you, you have yeah, here. You collected here? Sure. Uh, this is, uh, well, show them the, uh, the little medal that you got for being at uh, Dachau. Dachau, this is interesting, yes. Uh, a neighbor of mine is the new condos that I just moved in here in Clinton Township. He was with the 63rd. The, the, our division was activated after the war as a peacetime division in San Francisco. And he was with it, and he was in Germany uh, during, uh, uh, in the 50s or 60s as uh, we still had troops over there. And they weren't actually uh, doing anything except, you know, helping out. And he found out that I was at that cow. And uh, he had this pin, and he gave it to me. The sad thing is he well, gave it to me just before he died. He passed away at 54. Well, flip it around here, and I see you had yeah. the, uh, a visit to the National World War II Memorial hat. Yeah, well, that's, that's the big story that comes after the war experience that I want to tell you about. This is because of my children. The, Butch, uh, I'm sorry. watch the monitor. You're moving it I, around, aren't you? Uh, when... Uh, and what is this? Uh, is this your divisional? Uh, right, divisional, uh, the 63rd emblem. And then and you the, probably uh, wear a prison of war missing in action. Right. Pin. That's what I, right. That's what's on my papers. I had to buy those though, because the government didn't give. They just give you ribbons, right. like I have here. This uh, about this though. This is this whole setup that you see here is because of my children. I never told anybody in my family of my experiences. None of them knew about this. The war, the prisoner war, none of that stuff. And then Tom Broca, you know, five years ago, wherever it was, four or five years ago, come up with this, uh, The Greatest Generation. Absolutely. Uh, it started bringing back my memories. I tried to forget all of this, but it brought the memories back. I had collected all this crap, and it was down in boxes in the basement buried. And I had been carrying it with me for the 55, 60 years, of, well, it's actually 60 years now since it happened. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to send him a little note about what happened to me, because that's what he wanted for his little book. Well, I started writing it down and putting it down, and all of a sudden I got 60, 70 pages. Well, he's not going to take that. So I decided, well, I'll just keep it together, and maybe I'll make a book out of it or something. Well, then the kids saw all of this, my children, and oh my God, you never told us about this. Well, they took me, took me to the war memorial on a trip to buy, get this hat for me. They bought me prisoner of war hats, and I got the prisoner of war flags, and they started collecting all this stuff, and I said, so I brought it up out of the basement, and my wife saw this in another place. And so I paid $125 a place over here in Garfield and had all this stuff put in there. Well, let's sit, uh, get sitting in a boxes shot down the of uh, some of this memorabilia. Uh, maybe you can talk uh, about some of your medals here. Uh, I've got to get, get, get a good view here first. You got a good view, Paul? Yep. Okay, we'll start off with the first one, which is my... Silver, uh, bronze star, then my prisoner of war badge, and this is the European uh, zone, fighting zone, with two battle stars on it for the two battles I was in, and this is the American zone that I got because I did service here on the state side at Percy Tilt, Jones. Tilted a little bit, which I've getting, there you go. And this is the Good Conduct Medal, which, uh, I mean the Victory Medal, excuse me, the last one's a good comic medal, somebody might argue about it, <laughs> since of my, the, the way I acted. But this was after I was released of all his problems. Of course, the best medal is the one in the center here, which is the, uh, the for the battles and everything as a combat medic. This combat medic badge is here. And there's the uh, white cross there. Yeah, and my litter, showing me what the litter I carry. Sur service identification. Right, and that's all. All non-fighting personnel had to have these. This was because of the Geneva Convention. Right. They, uh, we had to carry this into combat. And uh, the odd part of that is, you look at that picture of myself. It was taken on Halloween, 1944. So I got a Halloween picture of myself. And then underneath it is uh, my arm band that I had on the all the time, even when I was captured. That all uh, medics carried on their arm to show that they were doing uh, medical work in my shears, which was just an oddball thing I stuck there. And then on this side, I have my PFC stripe. I never got any higher than that, because all I wanted to do was get out. I didn't want to become a, a general or anything. 
and my badge. And there's the badge for uh, underneath it's a medal for a gun, my uh, rifleman, uh, rifleman ship when I, before I became a medic. And on this side is nothing more than my six month overseas stripe, my discharge badge that we all had to wear in our uniforms until we gave up our uniforms after the Second World War. And the sixth army patch, which was for my service at Percy Jones Hospital. Now, I noticed on the dog tags here, there's a little notch at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I believe, if my memory is correct, that that was when you found a uh, dead soldier in the field, yeah. you would take one yeah. of the tags and put the other one in his mouth and put that little notch in the bottom of his teeth and close his jaw. Yep. Did you ever see any of that? Or? No, I didn't. But okay. I, I knew that's what the second one was for. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, we have we have a book here, and before we finish up, we want to see what a good-looking guy you were uh, back in uh, 1944. In 1944, you have some uh, army photos. Uh, yeah, you know, those were taken. The first ones were when I was inducted at uh, Fort Sheridan, Illinois, and then the other one standing next to the barracks is in Fort Hood, Texas. Oops. which was Camp Hood at that time. It's now a, a fort. It's right. a full military base today. And there you are below in a uh, jeep, and you can see the white uh, red cross on it. That's uh, the jeep that I was in when I was captured by the Germans. Ah. And uh, the, the driver, that's the driver uh, from, uh, he's down in Georgia. I talked to him, Phillips, and Lieutenant Jordan. Uh-huh. Who was with me? He's the Did one that I Did you personally thank him for selecting you to be his aide? Uh, no, I don't believe so. <laughs> okay. I wasn't doing anything except praying to get, get out of this alive. Well, briefly, give us a little bit now a history of what happened to you immediately after war. Where'd you go to work? Well, let's let's start with just before I was discharged. Actually, in March, two months before I was discharged, I was uh, because I was working the night shift. Uh, I was working 48 hours on and 48 hours off. So as soon as I was off at 7 a.m., I ran right down to the train station and took the train into Detroit mm -hmm. and uh, come home. Uh, because in March, probably the, the 14th of March, I believe it is, during Lent, uh, I was at the CYO Center where I used to go from school at St. Catharines. The uh, Christian Youth uh, Organization took over the old uh, Deutsches House. It was a, a German... Uh, bonding place that was in Detroit and of course it was confiscated when the war started and the CYO uh, purchased it. So I go there because they had uh, things going on there all the time. They had a bowling alley in there, they had a theater and uh, I had spent time in there while I was, before I was even uh, in the service. So I went back there and here it is, it's Lent and uh, they're having Lent talks down the, in the basement and uh, after that, they have a jukebox with uh, some dancing and some drinks and everything, uh, some pop and what have you. And I met a charming young girl, young lady, as it turns out, an 18-year-old. Uh, and this turned out to be my wife later on. So I was every day off. I went back uh, to see if she was at the CYO Center or meet her. fell in love. Oh, immediately. And my family just really give me the business because they said I went screwy. But I told you I never dated or anything before. I went to the service, never had a date. So your so, lifestyle's <laughs> changed real quick. Very much. So anyways, uh, so when I got discharged on the 1st of May, uh, as soon as I got home uh, on the train, the first thing I did was went to the phone, called Margo, and made my first date. I called, I said, let's go out Sunday. Uh, my buddy who was in the Navy, who turned out to be my best man at my wedding, he worked with me at one of the stores that I worked with before I was uh, inducted. He was a Navy man. And uh, Ray and I uh, uh, got a date. And I called Margo. I said, what about Sunday? And she said, okay. So we first date. I picked her up at noon. Ray borrowed his brother's car. And we took off for the day. I picked up Margo. And uh, we went all over the, the state. We covered everything, dancing and everything. And, ended up that night over the East Side Drive-In, over where I lived for a while, then in Harper Woods with the, the show. And all of a sudden, before the movie's over, Margo says, you know, I gotta get home. My mother will be waiting at the door and she'll kill me. I found out she's an old straight-laced lady, her mother. So uh, I had to get her home. 
but we that was it. We started dating and uh, it went on for three years because uh, I didn't have a steady job then. I was going back and forth. I did work for Briggs uh, for a couple of years from January of uh, 47 to October of 48. In October of 48, Bartlett says, if we're getting married, we decided to set up the wedding for the next year, 1949. She says, you've got to have a regular job. She says, I know somebody over at Michigan Bell says you can get, get you in. So I went into Michigan Bell in October and had an interview with uh, somebody there and said, it's fine. Uh, I did all the tests and everything that she had to write up at the, I went through the regular channels before I got to this gentleman. He took the tests and everything and threw it in the wastebasket. He says, you start working Monday. It was just like that. So on October 19, 1948, I started working for Michigan Bell and I stayed with him for almost 34 years. And I uh, started out with just menial jobs as far as I was concerned, but the company was a cable splicer. And I only did was a helper. And I was out in the cold, we were up in the poles, and it, this was winter coming on, and I just couldn't stand that cold. And I was wrapped up with as many clothes as I could. But the first chance I had to get out of it, I did in the spring. I had a chance to go to another department, which I took. And this went on until uh, June 14th of 1954 when I got into sales and made management. And that's what I did until I, was, until I uh, retired in August 1st of 1982. Well, we got married uh, six months after I got the job, which we, she wanted, which was May uh, 21st of 1949. And her birthday is May 18th. She turned uh, 21. So her mother couldn't raise hell with her anymore uh, on May 18th of that year. And then that was when we got engaged in May 18th of 20, she was 22, then we got married. The reason I say May 18th is because if you notice, I uh, went down to Texas, I got there on May 18th, and when I got on the ship to ship back from Europe, it was May 18th. A significant date, go ahead. Right. And so everything worked out. She was working at Michigan Bell and I was. And two years after we were married, we had our first child, Kathy, who's 54 now. She's a counselor for the uh, uh, school district out in uh, New Baltimore. And the uh, second one came along, my son was born on uh, April 30th. And I told my wife, I said, why don't you cross your legs and hold on until May 1st, and then I have May 1st, May 1st, May 1st stuff. And, but it didn't happen, it was May 30th. And he's a uh, quality control manager for uh, industry here in Grosbeck. And my third is my uh, another daughter it was girl boy, girl boy, Kathy, Carrie, Kitty, and Kelly, all K's, all five letters. And Kitty was uh, March 11th. She came in in uh, 57. When we were living out, we moved out to uh, Redford Township at the time. We were over there for four years. We found out we were family, and we wanted to be with family, so we moved back to East Side the, uh, after she was born and moved into Harper Woods, where we stayed for 20 years. And then my young, youngest son, Kelly, was born right after we uh, moved back into Harper Woods. He was born at the St. John's Hospital. He was open up. He's our youngest son. He's also a teacher. Uh, and uh, he's the one that gets after me with all of this business. He's a science teacher over in Kelly Middle School on Kelly Road. That's where Kelly Shire is. Well, the best part of being married and having kids is grandkids. How many of those? And we have nine of them. Well, and uh, Kathy has uh, a boy and a girl. They're both married now. Uh, Laura, who's also now given me my first great-grandchild. I have a three-year-old great-grandchild. And uh, Gary has three. He has uh, two girls and a son. And uh, only the... Uh, Girl, the second girl, Danny, got married, and she just presented me with my second great granddaughter on April 20th of this year. And then there's uh, Kitty, who has three girls. Wind it up, getting low. Yeah, we are. I don't want to okay. cut you short, but uh, I want to thank you for your story. 
uh, as a, a veteran myself, I, uh, I'm honored to know you and uh, appreciate and uh, uh, want to say that uh, your commitment to service in our country is something that uh, we all should appreciate and honor. So, yeah, uh, my kids said the same thing. Thank you, Bill. My, my kids are really after me now. You. Right. And, uh, and you know I graduated finally. My daughter, Anchor Bay, got me my diploma after all these years. I'm glad you added that to our right. Well, so thank I, you for coming in. Right, and I, I hope this is a great uh, <laughs> show this time, fellas. It was nice dealing with all of you. Yes, I'd like to thank Paul and uh, Jerry for their uh, support, support and help today. Thank you.